Hi, it's Dr. Parikh, and we're to the most exciting and terrifying part of the class, creating your concept map. So the concept map here um, is an assignment about organizing your paper. Uh, let me zoom in on that a little bit. So I'm pretty flexible on what you submit. You can send in a photo of post-its or strips of paper organized. Uh, or f a photo of a hand-drawn concept map. You can also submit a PDF of you creating something through PowerPoint, Word, or websites like uh, there's bubble.us that I'll show you in just a moment. But what I recommend you doing first is what's called an article sort. And this is part of the way I have you write your article notes, the way you do. So I printed out my sample article notes here. And you'll notice I, so from the sample, I had some extra writing in the middle and I took all that out. And you'll also notice I ran a highlighter down the edge. That's because it's arts and crafts time. Woo. So I know this makes fabulous video, uh, but what you're going to do is actually make sure that you have printed it single sided and that you make sure that there's no paraphrases. I cut off all the extra stuff um, about like the population, the abstract, stuff like that. Uh, if I were writing this paper, I might keep a printout with that stuff handy. Um, just that, that stuff is more for your reference and to help you have a sense of whether you understood your article or not. So at the end, I have the top that has my reference. So this is like my key of where is my, you know, which article is it? And it has the keywords, which hopefully is enough to kind of jog my memory about which article it is. And then I have several other strips of paper uh, that are all marked. And I got this idea from a student, actually. I handed out highlighters so that they could kind of focus in on keywords as they go through. Um, and one of my students ran a line down each of the articles. What's fabulous about this is you'll have four different articles in your article sort uh, or sources if your fourth source is not an article. And so you will have different color. If you use different color for each one, one way you can check how integrated your piles are by just peeking at the colors. And if you notice that a pile is all one color, uh, it's a good sense that you need to go through and resort them. So what you do after you have all of your strips, I would do a nice little shuffle. So just like kind of a wash shuffle where you just put all your strips and you just kind of move them around like a little kid trying to shuffle cards who doesn't know how yet. Or if you're trying to shuffle like dominoes on a table, just kind of mash them together because you're trying to break out of the piles. Because here's the deal. Realistically, it will never be easier to write about your articles than to write about an entire article and then the next article, and then the next article in nice paragraph fashion. Um, that's always gonna be the easiest way. That's why I have requirements because even my best writers default to that for this class if I don't make you do it a different way. Um, I don't want you to summarize each article for me. I want you to use main ideas from the articles to make a bigger point. And again, this gets easier when you add more sources, but you're just not ready to deal with eight to 10 sources in this class. So it feels forced and artificial and it gets easier with more sources. Mostly it gets easier because you get more skills with it though. It doesn't magically become easy at any point, but you learn to deal with it and you get more tools for working through it. So I already went through and highlighted some main ideas from each one. You can also, you might, you might even add a, a little extra space. So add in a couple of blank spaces after each one so that you can write some keywords. Um, but I want you to focus on each idea as a single unit. Think about what it's really focused on. Um, so this one is paraphrase two from Messiah et al, 2014. Uh, found that almost three quarters of Haitian Americans in their Miami sample had been exposed to the Haiti earthquake either directly, 8%, or more commonly, indirectly, 63%. Um, so to me, this really focused, so I highlighted exposed to the Haiti earthquake and then indirectly 63%. That's what's most important to me. 
I'm really interested um, for this project. I'm interested in people who are immigrants or um, I'm actually interested in international students, which is different because they may or may not have plans to stay in the U.S. after they graduate. They might just be here for a little bit and then plan to go home. And so it's a different identity shift than being an immigrant and saying, this is where my life is now, even though my, you know, part of my heart and my family and people and things I care about is still somewhere else. So it's slightly different experiences. But either way, it's the idea that you are not directly exposed, but that you're still witnessing it in some fashion, whether it's on the news or on social media or people calling you, um, you're exposed somehow. The next one I'm focused, so I highlighted the word immigrants, family, place where the earthquakes took place, mental health disorder symptoms. Um, so this one, I, you know, you, you probably will rearrange the piles as you go a little bit. Um, so this, this was paraphrase one, and it's very similar to paraphrase two, because they're both getting at the idea that you can have mental health effects without being there, and that there are different factors. So here I might focus this and say, okay, this is really focused on um, intensity. And as I think about it, um, my paraphrase three, the last bit says, Messiah et al. found support for a dose-effect relationship where greater exposure to the earthquake was, effect was associated with more severe mental health effects. Uh, and paraphrase one, was about the more connectedness you have to the community, the more risk of mental health disorders. So these are two important things that are somewhat different from necessarily the idea that you just can have indirect exposure. Um, so as you go through, again, try to mix them up because as I'm doing this, it's hard because it feels like it's all talking about the same thing because the author of the article didn't suck at their job. Their job is to make a cohesive story. Your job is to take the main findings and think about how it weaves in with other main findings. Um, so I can't fully demonstrate how to do it with just one article, but what I can tell you is um, some students find it helpful. So for one, before you print it out, make sure that you have citations for each paraphrase because once you've cut it apart, it can take so long to figure out which article it came from. So make sure that you are correctly citing. So each paraphrase, each line needs to have uh, its own citation so that you can track back which article you got it from. Once you have your piles, you can kind of spread things out. You might choose to tape it tape, you know, tape your strips of paper together um, or tape it all to a board. You could also, as you're going through, try to take key ideas. And so you might have a pad of post-its and you might write down uh, indirect exposure. But again, you need to cite it. So indirect exposure, Messiah et al. 2014. Um, and you might put that down. And then as you move, you know, you can move your post-its around or index cards, whatever you want to use with the keywords, but make sure you're keeping track of citations because you need to get that integration. You need at least three main ideas for each theme. So you need two themes total, at least three ideas for each theme. And you don't need to do your paragraph breakdown yet, but you need to think about each theme needs to have two paragraphs that each use at least two different sources. That is the bare minimum to say that you're integrating sources. So you can use uh, post-its, index cards, uh, you can use these strips of paper. What I need at a minimum is to see that you have some sort of keyword or paraphrase from three different sources under each of your themes. Um, so you can do that and you can just physically take a picture of it with your phone and upload that to Blackboard. And that's enough for a concept map as long as, again, what I need to see is two themes with three sources each, with citation. I need to see the citation to indicate that it's a source. So for example, let's say I have paraphrase one and paraphrase three under the same theme. They are both Messiah et al. 
So this still counts as one source, even though I'm tracking my ideas that both of these ideas could fit in here. You can get as detailed as you want here, but you'll have an outline step still. So you don't have to do your whole outline here. Um, it's up to you how detailed you want to go. So you can do that using your strips of paper. You can do that using uh, post-it notes or index cards or scraps of paper. Um, what I might do is I might take uh, the, some of the extra paper I cut off and write, um, so like indirect exposure, and, and then put, you know, and I, so I might tear this in half and indirect exposure, and then the other one, let's say, would be mental health disorders. And so those might be my two themes, and underneath I need to show that I have three different sources pulled from. Um, you can also do it through Word using shapes or PowerPoint using shapes. There's also websites, so if I do, um, so I just searched concept map software. Uh, you can come up with things. Here this is showing you how to use, it looks like that's how to use uh, word. Mind mapping is another way that you can talk about it. Uh, my favorite one to use, um, is bubble.us, B-U-B-B-L dot U-S. And if I come in here, uh, I'm just going to do a demo for it. Um, and I might, so I might say indirect exposure, and there's keyboard shortcuts that you can learn to do it faster, but I can add things below. So I might say, um, let me see, I dropped some of my strips of paper. So 63% indirect exposure to Haiti earthquakes and Messiah et al. 2014. Remember, it's key to keep track of your citations. Now, I just hit the tab key, but you can also, I mean, there's different ways you can add on. So you need at least three, and you can move these things around. Um, and then I just kind of double clicked to create another one. So I like bubble.us. For me, it's kind of easy to work. You can move around. Um, you can even move things. So let's say I want that to actually just be under indirect exposure. I can move it around. Um, and I think there's probably ways. Oh, and you can, uh, you can organize it. So I find this software really flexible and nice. Um, and then when you're ready, you can save it. You can also... Uh, so you can save. JPEG should be fine. Um, you could also print and save it as a PDF that way. Let me see what happens when I do this. Is it going to pull up my... Yeah. And so you can... Um, there's different ways. Uh, Mac and PDF... Mac and... Sorry, Mac and Windows run a little differently. But there's, there's always ways that you can create PDFs. So I find the software easy to use. Um, if you're really stuck, I find that moving the pieces of paper around, whether it's the uh, printed article notes or whether it's post-its or, or index cards, I find that to be very helpful in taking a problem out of my head and putting it into the real world. Um, so if I'm really lost, I would usually start there. That's usually my first step is to make things written and more concrete. Uh, another thing I do, some, so when a student is stuck and doesn't know where to start, I just get out a big sheet of paper and I start saying, okay, go article by article, tell me some of the key words from each article. And then we start, so we get this, you know, and I, I try to kind of map things a little bit so similar ideas go close together. I'll draw some lines to show connections to things, sometimes some arrows. I might circle things that are main concepts. And then after we've gone through each article, I say, okay, where do you see the connections? Where do you see the overlap? And here's the thing. This is why I love teaching this course, because I usually have something in mind 
when I say that. Something has stood out to me as the student has talked me through. Now, I haven't re read these articles by, for myself. Sometimes I've looked at their notes. Sometimes I remember their notes. But I haven't read these articles the way you've read these articles. And when I sit across from you and I have something in mind, but I always ask you, what do you see? And often what you see is totally different from what I see. And I'm getting like goosebumps right now because this is the magic. This is the creation in something that is in many ways a stuffy ap academic process. I constrain a lot of what you do in this class. I constrain even more than academia usually does because I want to make it structured enough that I can grade everyone the same uh, in, in a consistent way. And I create a lot of structure to try to teach basic skills. But this is still magic. This is where you're creating something. You're not doing your own research. Uh, you're going to design a research project, but it's going to be, it's going to suck. I'm sorry. Um, I just, I constrain you so much that you can't ask anything really good, but you're not collecting the data anyway, so it's fine. But um, even though you're not doing research, even though you're not likely to publish this, even though you're not doing a really thorough review of the literature because you're only using 10 articles, or I'm sorry, you're not even using 10 articles. You're only using four sources. Um, it's still creative. You are still creating something that's never been out in the world. You're organizing this information in a way no one has ever seen before. And as you start to create paragraphs, you're going to make topic sentences in your outlines that cr say something about how this information is related, that tell your reader what to think about this. And it's exciting, it's artistic, it's creative, it's, it's you putting something out there in the world. And even though this is totally a training wheels project, it's meant to be small and manageable, it's still you seeing something in a way that nobody else would put quite together the same way. Um, I do the same thing for my in-class, you know, I'll do a demo, I'll ask someone to play along and I'll say, you know, somebody who's not, you know, you need to be familiar with your articles, but someone who's really not sure what they want to talk about. Because um, if you already know, why waste the class's time when we can help somebody? And I'll usually ask for other people. So again, just like me, they haven't read these articles, but they've listened to the way the person has described the main ideas. And I'll say, you know, okay, what ways could you organize it? And then I'll say, okay, somebody else, what way might you organize it? And what I think that really does is emphasize there's no right answer. It's also what's terrifying about this step. You are putting together a puzzle that nobody's ever seen before. So there is no picture on the box. There is no guarantee that things are going to fit together. You have to mash some things together. You may even go out and find a fifth and sixth source just to make things a little more cohesive. Um, so you're creating this puzzle. You're pushing things together that may not really go together that easily. And so you have to think about what's the most clear way to do it. Um, and you also get to see, say, you know, from these sources, what do I want to emphasize? What do I want to say? And it's really, for a lot of students, it's your first real step into not just thinking as a student, but thinking as someone who's contributing to the academic conversation. And that is so exciting for me. It's why I love this course. This step, this is why I love this course. So on that note, if you feel stuck, if you feel overwhelmed, if you feel like it's not working, reach out to me. This is my favorite thing. This is what I live in this course for. Um, and so I am more than happy. We can meet over video chat, over the phone, in person. Um, remember though, you know, if you can hit office hours, I'm usually pretty available. But if you need something other than normal office hours, you need to give me some time to find an appointment. Um, I can make something work if I have enough time. A week is ideal for to find something that works, but I know in this class that's an eternity, so we'll we'll try to do more of the three to four days range, but I just can't guarantee, you know, the more time you give me, the more flexible I can usually be in meeting your limitations. So if you want to meet with me, email me and start with at least three times, preferably at least two different days, um, but you want to get, or, you know, a couple ranges is even better. So for example, you know, mo 
you know, I might say, so right now, right this minute, I might say, okay, most weeknights after eight, I'm, I can be flexible for a video conference. Um, so tell me, you know, give me as much availability as you can, but at least three times, different times a day, um, so that I can try to find something that fits. Because if you just email me and say, can I meet with you? I'm going to say, okay. And I might start with a couple times, but it still just slows things down. Um, it's more back and forth. And sometimes, you know, I have periods where I don't really get to check email for a while. So if you need to meet with me, be proactive, be quick. Um, I'm happy to help. Thanks for watching. Good luck. This is the most exciting part. It's also the most terrifying, but we'll make it through. Thanks. Bye.